So this time last week, we were still reeling from Hurricane Harvey and now Irma. A solar flare this week and an ensuing earthquake in Mexico. The ongoing threat of nuclear war with North Korea. A drought, poor crops. Some of you farmers are starting to harvest and you know what that's about. So these are not good times that we find ourselves in. And some wonder, are these the end times? Are we in the end times? What book in the Bible talks about the end times? Well, the book of Revelation addresses the end times more than any other book in the Bible. And for good reason, it's the last book in the Bible because that's what it addresses, the end times. And so this morning, we're going to begin a new study in the book of Revelation. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn there with me, otherwise we'll put the verses this morning up on the TV monitor. It begins, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So the first word in the original is revelation. We get our word apocalypse from this word. We take apocalypse to mean the end times. Epic, worldwide, catastrophic events that turns everything upside down. Not the way things should be. Apocalyptic. They're talking about some of these hurricanes as being apocalyptic, aren't they? So all that is implied from our word, apocalypse, but the actual word here means an unveiling of, of taking the the blanket off of what is hidden so that you can see it. And the idea is that God is going to pull back the curtain to the future. And God is going to show us everything that's going to happen in the future, future events. So when he says revelation, he's talking about the unveiling, the disclosing, showing us down the corridors of time what we can expect to happen in the end times. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we are going to see Jesus Christ, but that's not the idea here. Yes, Christ will be seen. But the idea here is that Christ is the one that's giving this revelation. Christ is the one that's revealing to us what's going to take place in the old time, in the end times. And who gave this revelation to Jesus Christ? It says, which God gave him. So God gave this revelation to Jesus as a gift to him. And then Jesus now is giving this revelation to us, first to John, and he did it with the angel. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So here we see a progression. God the Father has given to his son Jesus this knowledge of future events. And Jesus wants to impart that to his beloved apostle John. And we'll see this in this chapter here. He does that by a revelation of himself, this majestic vision of Jesus Christ. But an angel is an intermediary from Jesus to John for the rest of the book. And so this revelation is intended to show his servants so that we as God's people, as believers, will know what we can expect in the future. And he says these things must soon take place. That little word, must. These things will happen. This book will be fulfilled. This is a prophecy, he calls it. It must happen. Why must it happen? Because the prophets told us these things would happen. In the Old Testament, we have all these prophecies of end times. Somebody has calculated that there are at least 737 different predictions in the Bible of things that will happen. These are things that are predicted in advance. Bible prophecy says over 525 of these prophecies have already been fulfilled. That leaves 213 left to be fulfilled. So we have things that God says are going to happen that have not happened yet. And if those things don't happen like God said they would happen, then that means God is not true, that God is a liar. And we know that is not possible. Everything that God says must happen. So there are still prophecies about the church, about the rapture. There are prophecies about the end times with the tribulation period, with an antichrist, with world governments that will rise up, 
with wars that will take place. There is a battle called Armageddon that must take place. There is a prophecy of the second coming of Christ when he comes back to this earth to take his rightful rule over it. There is an end time prophecy of a millennial period of a thousand year reign of prosperity and glory upon the earth. And there is the, the prophecy of the eternal state of the everlasting kingdom of God that goes on forever and ever and ever when God dwells with his people. So we have prophecies in the Bible that have not yet been fulfilled. Now there are some who say, well, those prophecies are being fulfilled right now. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So these things must take place. You see, God is in control. God has a plan. God is sovereign. And he is the one who has said, this is what I'm going to do. And if he is not able to do these things that he has prophesied that he is going to do, then that means he doesn't have all sovereignty. He is not in control. That means that his plan can be scrapped or revised. It's interesting how many times they've revised the forecast of Hurricane Irma. My wife has been watching this just so carefully this week because her parents are going to get hit by this. And they're talking about evacuating them and how all those logistics are going to take place. And so she has been glued to the news with this thing. And if you've been following this, and we, we have a team going to Haiti here in just a few weeks, we've been following this. And thankfully, the hurricane went around Haiti. And, and what they've been saying, okay, the eye and the, the, the eye wall is going to hit mat, smack right dab against Miami. And they said, no, it's going to go to the east of it. And then they just changed it. No, it's going to go to the west of it. And so all these people that didn't think they had to be evacuated now are having to be evacuated up further up to the panhandle, Tallahassee and Pensacola, all these places that thought they were safe. And they have been revising this forecast. Well, God doesn't have to revise his forecast about the future. This is set. What we read in Revelation must come to pass because it is God's preordained sovereign plan. And he says this is soon to take place. That must soon take place. So as I said, some interpret the book of Revelation as these events are happening now. So we have some catastrophic event somewhere in the world, and they say, well, that's the third seal that's happening right now, or that's the fifth seal that's happening right now. We're in Revelation right now. There's others that interpret the book of Revelation and say everything that's happened in the book of Revelation up until chapter 20 has already taken place. It's past. When Rome came in in AD 70 under the Roman uh, Legion army and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, all this was predicting that. All this is past history. All this is now being fulfilled with the church as spiritual Israel up in the heavenlies. And they get into all this allegorizing the Bible that doesn't make any sense to me. See, this interpretation that revelation has already happened, it's past event. It doesn't line up with its future. It has to be taken future. Jesus hasn't come back yet. We'll see this in verse 7. He, the promise of his coming, and he didn't come back in AD 70. That wasn't him. So it says these things must soon take place. Now, he did not necessarily mean that when he was writing these things, that on the heels of the ink drying, that it would begin to happen right away. Now, this idea of soon, it can mean quickly. The original word is where we get our word tachy, like tachycardia. When you have a tachycardia, that's not good. It means a racing heart. It means a rapid heartbeat, and you don't feel good. It's the idea that when these things, when it's time for these things to happen, they will happen quickly. It's not like there will be 100 years for the first seal and we'll wait another 500 years and we'll see one of the other seals happen. No, when they begin to happen, they will happen very rapidly. That's the idea here. They will soon happen. He says, he made it known. He made it known. Now the authorized version says, signified it. Signified. Signs. Symbols. The, the book of Revelation scares many people because they read these things, these symbols. They say, 
what do those things mean? What, what, what do these signs mean? And, you know, Martin Luther, the reformer in the 16th century, he, he didn't even think the book of Revelation belonged in the Bible. And some of the great giants in church history, they didn't write commentaries on it because to them it was a, an enigma, a puzzle. It was something that they had no idea what God was saying. It scared them away from God's truth. And yet, by far, Revelation really is understood from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the key code to interpreting the book of Revelation. It doesn't quote the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation doesn't quote the Old Testament directly, but in its 404 verses, about 265 of those uses the language from the Old Testament. And 550 references are to Old Testament passages. So whenever we come across one of these symbols, we say, what does that mean? We go back to the key code. We go back to the Old Testament. So if you understand the Old Testament, you're going to be able to understand the book of Revelation. And there are times when the Lord himself, he interprets the symbol for us. So we understand exactly what it means. So this is not to be a book of mystery that causes us to wonder, well, what is God going to do here? And I realize that some of this has been sensationalized. And, and as we begin this study, I will just make a full disclosure. I have not read the Left Behind series. All right, so anything that I say that maybe sounds like what you read there, I didn't get it from there. Now, I don't know if I'm going to come up with helicopters because of these beasts like they did in the Left Behind series. But I think as we come to these symbols and we wonder what are they, we need to go back to the, Revel to the Old Testament because God's Word interprets itself. It sheds light on it. Now in verse 2, he moves on. He describes himself. I'm the one who bore witness to the Word of God, to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. He could be referring to the fact that he has already written the Gospel of John. He's already written the three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. You see, John has been living in Ephesus for about 30 years. He's been pastoring this church. These people are very dear to him. Actually, it'll be the first church that we come to in chapter 2. And so he has been writing the Gospel, writing these epistles while he was ministering in this church and to the other churches in the region of Asia Minor. So he's already been a faithful witness to the Word of God. But we know from history that the Roman emperor at this time, Domitian, he began to persecute the Christians. He tried to destroy the line of King David, to destroy a Messiah from coming back and usurping his rule over the Roman Empire. He began to persecute Christians. Some of them he executed. Now, he is being persecuted for his faith. But in spite of all that, he has remained faithful to God. Now, the tradition says that Domitian actually tried to boil him in oil. And when no harm was done to his body, that's when he was taken to the Isle of Patmos, which we'll see later. I don't know if that tradition is true or not. But he has faithfully recorded everything that God revealed to him in this book. And what a book this is. In verse 3, he says, Blessed is the one who reads allowed the words of this prophecy. So this book is a prophecy. It's telling us about end times. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So he promises this blessing to anyone who will read and hear this book. It's interesting. It, in the New Testament church, many of the people were slaves. Many of those people never had the chance for an education they never learned how to read. They were illiterate. And so the only way they were going to get the Word of God was if someone read to them the Word of God. And so they had readers in their New Testament local churches. They had those who were literate. And they were appointed to be the readers of the Scripture for that day. The fact that this is going to be read in the church is showing that it was considered inspired Scripture from God. They weren't going to read anything that wasn't inspired from God. It had to be in the canon, the Word of God. And so he gives this promise 
a blessing to everybody who reads and hears. You know, th- this is the only book in the Bible that gives a distinct promise of blessing to those who read it and hear it. Now, we know that all of God's word is useful to us. All of God's word is to our spiritual prophet. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It is beneficial. It is useful. It is to our advantage. All of scripture. But here is a special blessing to those who will hear this book. Some of us don't like Revelation. I've heard you make that comment. I don't like the book of Revelation. I hope as we do this study that you'll begin to love this book, that you'll begin to find the blessing that comes to us as we read and hear. But not just stop there. This book is meant to make an impact in our life. Those who keep what is written in it. You see, that's when the blessing comes, is when, when we obey what God tells us to do, not just the hearing of it. James reminds us in James 1, he says, don't merely deceive yourselves. Just listening to the word, thinking that's enough. He says, do what it says. Do what it says. And if we do what we find in this book, especially as we get into chapters 2 and 3 with the specific application to the churches, then we will see what God wants in our lives, how he wants us to be living our lives. So he says, for the time is near. Again, the people who say this has already passed, it happened right after John penned these words, that's not the idea. The word time has an idea of a season, has a time period. So we are in the church age right now, but the church age is going to come to an end when the rapture takes place, when the Lord comes back and takes us to heaven. The church age will be over. And then we will enter into a period called the tribulation period. That is a season. That is a time period. That is the time period that he's addressing right here. So when is that going to happen? Well, the Bible talks about the, the coming of the Lord could happen at any moment. The word that we use is imminence. Imminence. It could happen at any moment. And when the coming of the Lord takes place for the church and the rapture, Then we enter into the season that he's going to write about, beginning in chapter 6 all the way to 20, the time of the tribulation. So that is the introduction to us. What an introduction that is. But he gets into verse 4 and he gives the greetings. And the greeting is from God. He says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia... So they are the recipients. These seven churches will find, beginning in chapter 2, he, he, he will list them later in this chapter down in verse 11. We won't get that far today. But these are literal, specific churches like our church, the church of Berea in Marysville. And they're in Asia, not all of modern-day Turkey, but the western third part of Asia Minor. And so he's writing to these churches, and he says, I have a greeting to you from God. And the greeting is this, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priest to his God and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen grace to you and peace that's the gospel this is God's greeting to us it's always in this order grace always comes before peace First grace, and then we get the peace. There there is no peace with God. There is no peace in your soul without receiving the grace of God. The grace of God, his undeserved favor, his unmerited acceptance of us as sinners. Through Christ, we have grace. It's not based on who we are in ourselves. It's based on who you are in Christ, this grace. And accepting this grace, accepting Christ allows us to enjoy God's peace in our lives. We can be going through a storm. We can be going through a very difficult time when the bottom drops out 
and we're as low as we possibly can be in life, and yet we can still have peace in our lives because we know that we're right with God. We know we have this relationship with God that is secure, that our God is with us, and he is taking care of us. And this grace and this peace comes from the Trinity. It comes from him who is and who was and who is to come. That is God the Father. He exists right now as he has always existed in time past. He is eternal. He existed before no one or nothing else existed because he is self-existing. He needs nothing to exist. And he will always be this way. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne. This is the Holy Spirit. Now some take this to mean the angels. But I think it is better to see if, if we go back to the Old Testament, this is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. If you write down these references back in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, the Holy Spirit there is represented as seven. These seven qualities that he has that he will give to energize the Messiah for his ministry. We find in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 2 and 10, that the Holy Spirit is seen as the seven lamps of the Lord that go out to all the earth. And the lamps are symbolic of the eyes of the Lord are throughout the whole earth. He sees everything all the time. He is completely all knowledge about it, omniscient. And then verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, our Lord, had three titles for Christ. He's the faithful witness. While on the earth, Jesus taught people everything God told him to teach, even though that brought him into severe conflict with those religious leaders that would eventually lead to him being arrested and putting up on the cross. Jesus was the faithful witness. Here we see him in his office as the prophet. And then he is called the firstborn of the dead. Was Jesus the first to rise from the dead? No. Why is he called the firstborn of the dead? He was the first one from the dead to have an immortal body from that point on. His resurrection shows that he is the one that God has given his stamp of approval. That his resurrection authenticates that he is the true Messiah. And here we see Jesus in the office of the priest. And then it says... He is the ruler of kings on earth. As we get toward the end of our study in chapter 19, we will see that Jesus Christ is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. Here we see Christ in his role as king, prophet, priest, and king. He is the supreme ruler over all. And this grace and this peace that comes to us through God, through the Holy Spirit, and through Jesus was the result of the Savior's love for us. Note, he loves us. Not loved, as some of your translations read, but loves. Not past tense, but present tense. Now, did Jesus love us in the past? Absolutely, he loved us in the past. Paul says, he loved me and he gave himself for me. He says, Christ loved the church, gave himself for her. It is true Christ loved us in the past. It's good to know that Christ loved us in the past. But does Christ still love us? Some of these Christians are going through terrible persecution under the Roman Emperor Domitian. Has God forgotten us? Has he abandoned us? Where is our God? He loves us. There's no reason to ever question, does God love me? We look at to the cross and we see what he did for us at the cross. And he, he spared not his only son. How will he not also freely give us all things? Paul says at the end of Romans chapter 8, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And he lists all these things. Nothing, nothing, nothing. He loves us. Some of us have done some pretty nasty stuff. Jim talked about the crummy stuff he did in his life. And, and we're all there to some degree. We've all done it. Does God still love me? I feel guilty for those things that I did. Does God still love me? Is his love conditional or is it unconditional? And the Bible tells us that his love is an everlasting love. That we cannot do anything to make him stop loving us. He loves, present tense, it continues to be there. He loves, he loves, he loves 
And he has freed us from our sins by his blood. Now the authorized version says he's washed us. And that's true. The blood of Christ cleanses us from our sins so that we are forgiven, so that we have a right standing before God. He looks at us not in our sin, not as guilty and deserving to be condemned, but he looks at us in Christ as righteous. And it's hard for us to grasp that. But the older manuscripts use the word, he has loosed us, he has released us, he has set us free. Not only are we set free from the condemnation, the penalty of sin, which is spiritual death, separation from God, but we are set free from sin's power so that we are no longer have to be the slave to sin. Jesus said, whoever sins is the servant, the slave of sin. And some of us feel like we're enslaved to sin. Every time we're tempted, we say yes. Like it's our master, we have to obey it. And Jesus says, you know what? This redemption that I provided for you is so wonderful because it not only puts you in a right standing with God, I've taken away that sin where when you reach out now, you don't hit the ceiling and you can't get to God. I've, I've removed that. Now when you reach out to God, you can grab his hand. You can be in relationship with God because of my sacrifice for your sins on the cross. I've removed that sin barrier. But it doesn't stop there. He says, I've set you free from it. So you don't have to obey temptation. You don't have to obey sin. You don't have to obey Satan anymore. You can obey Jesus. When that temptation comes, you say, you know what? I don't have to do that. I'm not going to do that. You know, if we'll just learn to have our minds set on the Spirit. It says the mind set on the Flesh is death. Every time we set our minds on the flesh and we give in to temptation and we sin, we, we break off that relationship with God. But when we set our mind on the Spirit and what God wants for us and we say yes to that, He says you have life and peace. You enjoy relationship. You enjoy fellowship with me. He set us free. I'll just say it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. He set me free. It's okay to say amen because we're going to find that in the text. Not only that, he's made us in verse 6 a kingdom. These words were echoed at Mount Sinai by God when he's speaking to Moses about the nation of Israel. He says in Exodus 19.6, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You're going to be a kingdom. A kingdom of priests. Israel was to be a nation who lived under the kingship of God. A theocracy. That God rules over us. Not a democracy, but a theocracy. God is our ruler. We live in his kingdom. We live under his rules. And he's saying that to us now. We belong to God. We're his kingdom. We live under his rules. We live under his authority. He says he's made us priests to his God and Father. The priests in the Old Testament were the only ones who had that immediate access to God through the sacrifices. They were the only ones who could draw close to God, who could be in, in the holy place. Not the Holy of Holies. That was once a year for the high priest. But they could go into God. They're at the holy place and draw near to God. They were the only ones. The people, the regular people that were not priests could not do that. They did not have access to God. And when he says, we are priests now, he says, you don't have to go through a priest or a pastor or some spiritual leader to have access to God. He says, you have access to God 24-7. Think about that. You have access to God anytime, anywhere, because he counts you as a priest. This is good stuff. And what does he say about that? He breaks into this doxology. Wow, look at what God has done. 
Glory, praise to God. And then he says, amen, amen. That's another way of affirming all that God has said is true. And then we get to the theme of the book, verse 7. He is coming. Behold, he is coming. This is the first prophecy in the book. If you go back to the last chapter in Revelation 22, you'll find that this is how the book ends. In verse 12, in verse 20, we see it again. Behold, I am coming soon. Surely I am coming soon. This becomes the theme of the book. So those who interpret Revelation as past, like they say from here to chapter 20, has already taken place. It's past. It hasn't already taken place. Jesus hasn't come back yet. He hasn't come back in his second coming yet. He didn't come back in A.D. 70 through Rome and destroy Jerusalem. He didn't do that. It says Jesus Christ is returning and every eye will see him. Now, how was that possible back in the first century when John wrote that? They didn't have satellites and television and worldwide broadcasting where you could see something live as it was taking place in the other part of the world. They didn't have the internet technology that we have today. How, how could that happen back then? Every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. You say, well, those people long died. That was 20 centuries ago. How, how can those people that pierced him see him when he comes back? And I would have to say that those people are representative of, of all of us, what we would have done to Jesus if we had been alive. All tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen, this wailing is not wailing out of a repentant, broken heart. God, forgive me for breaking your laws. It's not that at all. It's this hardening of the heart. We don't want you to come back. We don't want this judgment. So in verse 8, God assures us that this prophecy is true and will come to pass when he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, The Alpha and Omega, of course, is the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. God again says, I am the one who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. He says, I've always existed. I always will exist. I have all power. I have all authority to rule. I am sovereign. These things are going to happen. Jesus says in John 10, 35, the scripture cannot be broken. No one can mess with God's plan. No one can interrupt, no one can ruin God's plan. He is Alpha Omega. All of this that we're going to study will come to pass. It's going to happen. There's no doubt there's, there's no gamble. There's no odds here. This is going to happen. And the question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Have you made your peace with God? Are you experiencing His peace because you've received His grace through Jesus? And when it happens, it's going to be quickly. So you need to be ready now. Let's pray. Father, help us to pause long enough to reflect on some of these teachings, on some of these phrases, on some of these verses. Lord, help us to remember who you are. Lord, as we see the, the devastating winds, the, the power of this hurricane, Lord, it's just a faint echo of your power, of what you can do. Lord, there's no one as mighty, as awesome as you. Lord, we shudder to think what's going to happen to this world. And we know that the world is deserving of it. 
because we've sinned against you and you are a holy, righteous God. But we thank you, Father, that you are waiting so that all could come to repentance to the knowledge of the truth of your Son as their personal Lord and Savior. So Lord, help us to make sure that we're ready to meet you. Lord, work in our hearts, we pray. Lord, give us the blessing of those that have read and heard and kept this book, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, bless you today as you go.